Hi everyone, really happy to be with you again today. My name is Leslie. Today I want to talk about something kind of cool, kind of fun, which is the La Brea Tar Pits. It's our sister museum on Wilshire Boulevard. Looks a little something like that. Many of you have been there before. It is an incredible place where real science is happening in the city. This is urban paleontology happening. Now a lot of people think that um, you know, that, that paleontology is always about the hunt for dinosaur fossils. And of course that's cool and fun, but there's a lot of other really cool stuff to be found out there. Life 10, 20, 30,000 years ago in Los Angeles looked really different than it does today. And, you know, the animals that are most famous from the tar pits uh, fossil collection, the, you know, the big dramatic ones, right? The sloths and the mammoths and mastodons. You know, they've got an interesting story to tell. But it's the smaller stuff, the stuff that was living around at their feet, <laughs> I think is the most interesting. And in particular, that stuff is still around today. That's what I'm going to be sharing with you is animals who were alive then and are still around today. They saw the humans arrive. They give us a really accurate picture, a window into what life was like. It would be like opening up your window and seeing this. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> so um, what is it that our paleontologists are looking for? What kind of fossils? Well, of course, bones. They also look for plant fossils. Now, why plants? Um, they can give us a really uh, accurate view um, because they can't travel, right? I bet you know that there are plants that can only survive in certain climates, like a cactus. Where does a cactus grow? In dry places, right? So plants can give us a lot of clues because they can't leave. So what exactly happened at the tar pits? By the way, the word is asphalt. I'm going to go ahead and use the word tar today because we're talking about animals. So this is what it looks like when the tar, the asphalt, seeps up through the earth. It still happens today. It's ooey gooey, sticky, and animals will get stuck in it. Plants will get stuck in it. Um, unfortunately, I know it's kind of a bummer to think about. It still happens today, as a matter of fact. So a little bit of a bummer to think about that, but it gives us some really cool information. Over time, it concretizes. It becomes very hard and our paleontologists have to work so hard to dig out each and every bone, each and every big bone and each and every tiny bone. Here's the skeleton of a frog. Look at how tiny those bones can be. Each toe is full of bones. Every toe bone tells a tale. I'm gonna make a shirt that says that. <laughs> so our paleontologists have to sort of put this puzzle together by looking at, yes, the big dramatic animals, the mammoths and mastodons and saber-toothed cats, but also, again, the little stuff. Never forget the little stuff. I brought a few with me today. This is a darkling beetle. Here we go, kind of hiding there in the bark a little bit. Let's see if I give them a nudge if they want to walk around. <laughs> Not right now. So when you study the life of a little animal that lived back then, it might give you some clues about what the climate was like, what the weather was like, what, um, you know, what are they doing with their time? So we've got ourselves some little beetles who are detritivores. They have these little antenna and they like to crawl around in the leaf litter uh, looking for detritus. They look for um, anything, actually, <laughs> leaves, carrion, fruit, whatever. They're important cleanup crew, all right? Um, and they're food for other animals. Now, you might have seen, that's actually not our native species, but this is. This is a darkling beetle doing what they do best, their little handstand, and they actually spray kind of a stinky, nasty smell out their hind end. Uh, so a lot of animals would be turned off by eating that, but not birds, doesn't bother them. They can't smell in general. But they are still an important food source because of they're babies. They're babies. There we go. Let's see if it'll focus. Also known as grubs or mealworms. If I get out of the picture, there we go. There we 
go, the little bitty mealworms. Now that's delicious food for a lot of different animals. They also will pupate, which means uh, they have a metamorphosis. This one right here is grown rather large and it's about to pupate. There we go, look how curled up it is. And it will look like this when it does. Ooh, how cool is that? <laughs> it looks like a strange little alien. But this is no different actually than uh, a butterfly's chrysalis, right? Um, it's the same thing. It's a metamorphosis into an adult. So the grubs, the pupa, that's the stuff that's delicious to a lot of other animals. Um, there's some other small animals I want to share with you. We've got ourselves uh, a little Pacific tree frog. Look at that. His name's Kumquat. He is really cute. He doesn't live in this little cube. This is just to show him to you for a few minutes, and then he's going to go back home to his palace. Um, but these were found as well in the La Brea Tar Pit fossil collection. So what does that tell us? Well, let's learn about their life just a little bit. I bet you know what is the first stage of life for an amphibian. A lot of you are going to say tadpole. And of course, yes, the tadpoles are adorable. Look at that little face. They're so cool. They swim in the water. They eat algae, so they have a very aquatic life to begin with. Um, I bet a lot of you don't know, though, that they... Really, even before that, they start out as eggs. There's their beautiful little eggs floating in the water, and there's some adults who are down there making more eggs together. So water is crucial to amphibians. They start out life there. Uh, they breathe and drink through their skin. Okay, this little frog right here drinks through his skin, in particular through this little seat patch right there where he can really absorb a lot of water. So the fact that we find them in the fossil record tells you that there was probably water. So how do these little guys get stuck anyway? All right, let's look at what the tar looks like, okay? So we can see it's all bubbly and gooey, but do you notice that behind there's leaf litter there? You know, if, if leaves fall, if dust falls, it's gonna make it hard to see the tar. And so a little creature who um, might be walking around with their little antenna in the leaf litter, might get stuck. Or water can even cover up the tar, the asphalt. So uh, amphibians who were going down to have their you know, nightly pool party, it'd be the least fun pool party ever, when they discover that they uh, are actually stuck in the asphalt, in the tar. So, um, but their presence tells us something. These are both animals that are ectothermic, Okay? That means their body temperature is dictated by the air around them. So we know it was warm at least sometimes. Okay? And we know that there was probably some moisture around. There was frogs and toads found, by the way, and they're still alive today. Uh, so that's a really good indicator, too, because toads um, tend to like drier habitats, but tree frogs don't as much. They're not found in the desert like toads can be. So uh, that's given us some good clues. Uh, another really cool animal that would be found would be the owner of this. <laughs> this is a pond turtle shell, our only native pond turtle, the western pond turtle. Now the paleontologists wouldn't find it like this, unfortunately for them. They might just find one little piece of bone. This is a skeleton. This is, this is the animal's skeleton uh, on the outside there without the head and legs and etc. Um, now let me show you the actual animal here. I've got Poppy, the western pond turtle. <laughs> there we go. Isn't he adorable? Look at that. Now he's quite a bit larger, as you can see, than a lot of the natural-sized pond turtles. This guy's been living um, with us most of his life, getting a really good diet and really uh, a good little life. So he's quite large. Actually, as soon as I'm done with here, I'm going to take him outside to his outdoor pond. Um, but I just wanted to show you, you know, um, another animal that can be found. Here we go. This is a little bit of the pond turtle's life. You can see they're actually really good climbers. People don't realize turtles can climb. There they would go up a branch, uh, and they still do today, sitting there above bodies of water, streams, or ponds. And a lot of people think turtles live in the water, but they really hunt there or they take cover there. So they'll sit on these branches and if trouble comes, they'll dive right in. Or they'll hunt for frogs or fish or snakes in there. 
lot of people don't realize that turtles are hunters too. Now the last animal I've got to share with you, you've probably noticed has been climbing around behind me this whole time. This is Percival. Percival is a rosy boa. Isn't he gorgeous? Named for that gorgeous color. Now the snakes, there's a lot of snakes also found in the fossil record. And let's learn about their little lives for just a second and see what that tells us. So um, they have this forked tongue, that's what it looks like, the forked tongue that they use to find their food as they're slithering along. They stick out that tongue, gives them as much information as they can so they might follow a scent trail from a mouse that's long gone, actually. It's been gone for 10, 15 minutes and they can still follow that scent trail. So it's pretty incredible. Uh, they can be found in a lot of different environments. There's a lot of different snakes here in California and from the fossil record. And they would blend in beautifully in the grass or as you can see, they're really, really good climbers. <laughs> that's uh, Percival's using his muscles and using his belly scoots, the scales, to climb around. Uh, and here's what actually Percival's little environment looks like. Isn't he pretty? He really blends in so nicely to the granite and the sandstone. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous snake. Now these guys tend to like uh, going down into nests. They're kind of nest raiders. So they're found um, primarily on the ground, but they can do some climbing. Interestingly, one of the most common snakes found at the tar pits is gopher snakes. Uh, excuse me, not gopher snakes, I mean um, garter snakes. I was looking at a picture of a gopher snake, <laughs> which I'll show you in a second. Uh, garter snakes, uh, they tend to hunt in water. So that, again, tells you something really interesting looking at the little life of each animal found. So we have all these garter snakes. So there was probably some water. There's actually also a lot of rattlesnakes. I'm not sure what that tells us, although they really like to hunt rodents. And rodents really thrive when there's a lot of plant growth. And a lot of plant growth happens when there's a lot of water. So maybe it's also an indicator of moisture around. Um, again, we know that it was warm enough for these ectothermic animals, the reptiles, the frogs, the invertebrates to survive. So they're all giving us this really interesting view. Um, now, how might the snakes get caught? Well, they might follow a scent trail down. Um, they might actually even be going for a drink. You know, snakes primarily get their food or their water from their food. But here's a little video. Can you see the snake kind of sucking water up? They'll even drink out of these shallow little puddles. I'll put that video on our Instagram later for you to check out. Um, so I really, I, I really hope you enjoyed visiting with all of these cute little creatures who lived at the feet of mammoths, at the feet of the dire wolves, who can give us um, a really special view into our past. Do check out our Instagram at NHMLA underscore live animals to find out more about our living collection. And you can ask me questions there or you can ask me questions on the Facebook post where you're gonna see this. So thank you so much for joining me again. I hope to see you soon. Thank you.